Good evening, everyone. This is Claire Stewart here from Tuberous Sclerosis Australia. Welcome to our first ever Australian TSC webinar. Um, we've kicked off with one of the more controversial topics um, happening at the moment in tuberous sclerosis complex, which is around emerging treatments for epilepsy and TSC. And specifically tonight, we've asked Dr. John Lawson, a paediatric neurologist at Sydney Children's Hospital, to speak to us about medicinal cannabis and mTOR inhibitor medicines, two of the emerging treatments for epilepsy in TSC. I just wanted to start by mentioning that this conference is supported by an educational grant from Novartis. I wanted to make sure you understood that and you also understood that Novartis had absolutely no input into the content or even the topic selection for the webinars as a part of this project. At any time, if you have any questions about um, the relationship between Tuberous Sclerosis Australia and Novartis, I really welcome you um, to get in touch and chat to either myself or Debbie Crosby, our president, or even any member of the TSA Management Committee about this. Um, we're very into transparency and, and open conversations, so, um, so do get in touch if, if you'd like to. I just wanted to um, take a minute before I hand over to John um, to tell you a little bit about Tuberous Sclerosis Australia. I know that we have a few people that have registered that aren't familiar names um, to me, so I just wanted to um, take this chance to make sure that you understood the range of activities that TSA does and that you understand that even after tonight's call, um, we're here to talk to you or provide information via email or just even through our website. So although we've been around for it's as old as I am, so 30, what's that, 36 years, and started very much as a patient support group, um, our activities are now are quite broad, so across providing information, uh, providing direct support and facilitating peer support, as well as getting involved with advocacy and research activities in Australia. Um, so I encourage you that if you haven't engaged much with Tuberous Sclerosis Australia previously, um, to have a look at the website, uh, pick up the phone, send us an email. We're really happy to hear from you. Um, we know that our education events, which have historically been held face-to-face, -face, can be difficult for some people to attend. Um, and we're keen to, to try out this online um, mode and really happy to hear your feedback at the end of tonight's call. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. John Lawson, who will be familiar to many of you, looking at some of the names of the people that have joined us today. Um, so as I said, John is a paediatric neurologist who specialises in epilepsy at Sydney Children's Hospital and is also a lecturer at the University of New South Wales. Um, he has training um, in Newcastle um, and Sydney as well as in the US um, at Miami Children's Hospital. Um, John has, uh, has welcomed TSA's uh, pushing him into an interest in tuberous sclerosis over the last what, decade or so, or date, uh, date all of us, John. Um, and he is the co-director of the TSC multidisciplinary clinic held at Sydney Children's Hospital. Um, John's been involved in research in TSC for a number of years, including some of the research that I'm assuming he's going to talk about tonight. Um, and he's been a long-time medical advisor to Tuberous Sclerosis Australia, um, and as a part of uh, an acknowledgement of his efforts and, and dedication in that space, John was awarded the 2012 Elizabeth Pinkerton Memorial Award by TSA. Um, and certainly given his recent interest in medicinal cannabis, um, is the ideal speaker for tonight's topic. I'll stop talking now um, and uh, uh, hand you over to John, who's looking really ready to go. So, um, so go for it, John. Okay. Uh, thank you, Claire, very much. Um, so, good good evening to everybody, and um, really pleased to um, to uh, after that very professional introduction by Claire. I hope I can be um, just as professional. Uh, I think just an important message: if you aren't hearing me properly, or if you're having any any trouble with the slides, then um, then uh, the Redback support uh, people will will hopefully help you out. So this is a bit of a this is a brand new thing for me to do. I've never done a webinar, um, and so uh, please please be gentle to me. Um, you won't be able to talk to me, but um, you will be able to answer ask me questions at the end through um, typing. So uh, so you, you, look, you can start typing whenever you like. You, you, the questions. You don't need to wait for me to finish um, before you type your questions in case you forget. Um, 
So what I'm going to be talking about, and as Claire said, it's this is extremely topical. You know, it's on on Sydney radio this morning, maybe maybe across the country, um, almost at least it's a different story about medicinal cannabis um, every week. So I'm hoping to bring um, bring some information on, on an area that really um, there's still a fair bit of mystery about, and, and hopefully um, show that there is a path forward for um, for people with TSC and using some of these new medicines. So let's move forward. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, just to say that the that epilepsy, uh, you know, I'm talking to an audience that knows this very clearly, that epilepsy is really the most common symptom of, of tuberous sclerosis. And, you know, one of the biggest clinics in the world is at Boston, and, and they looked at, uh, I think that now they've got, you know, 700 people who attend, but in a paper they published in 2010, they spoke about 300 of their patients, and um, 85 out of 100 of those patients had epilepsy. And it's not only that they've got epilepsy, but it began very early in life. And so um, what, what median age means is that half of them had their epilepsy begin before seven months of age. And of those who develop epilepsy, um, most of those begin in the first couple of years of life. So it's it's very common, and it and it strikes early, as as many in the audience would know. <clears throat> a a, a pe peculiar thing about tuberous sclerosis is that it's a it's a common presentation is with infantile spasms. So about a third of people with tuberous sclerosis will present with the the uh, a very severe epilepsy in infancy. Um, which is also called West syndrome, which can be very difficult to treat. Um, in the longer term, two out of three people with tuberous sclerosis um, and epilepsy have what we call refractory epilepsy. Another word for that is treatment resistant. Um, now that's very different to the, if you just take the general uh, population of people with epilepsy, it's, it really is the opposite number there that, um, that two out of three people in general with epilepsy will have easy to treat epilepsy. They'll, they'll, their epilepsy will come under control after one or two drugs. Um, and it, in the general epilepsy population, it's one in three people who have treatment resistant epilepsy. But it's the opposite in tuberous sclerosis. It's two thirds of the, of the TSC population have refractory epilepsy. So, so much more difficult than the general epilepsy population. The other tr tricky thing um, is that many people who've got epilepsy have just got one one seizure type that comes from one part of their brain. But in tuberous sclerosis, um, the, you know, it's not a surprise that you know, with multiple regions of the brain, multiple tubers being abnormal, many children and, and adults can have more than one seizure type. Seizures can come from more than one spot, which makes um, some of the other treatments, like like surgery, much more difficult. Um, in the in this particular uh, paper from Boston, but also and this is just one sample. Um, they looked at their patients who'd had surgery, and so, oops, uh, my screen saver just went on. Um, the uh, so a, a their group about about one in ten of their population had had epilepsy surgery, but only. Um, a quarter of them had become seizure free after the surgery and um, and that so that also shows that even those who were selected to have surgery um, to try and help their epilepsy they didn't do very well and um, and that's very different to other types of epilepsy which are surgically treatable where your chances of being seizure free might be seventy or eighty percent in this particular group only a quarter were seizure free and and I know certainly there'd be some people in the audience who who have um, who have experienced that as well, both being seizure-free and, and continue to have seizures after surgery. Um, epilepsy clearly is a is a enormous impact, you know, on so many aspects of life and um, and for people with TSC. And just one of those highlighted in this paper was that if you've got tuberous sclerosis and you have never had seizures, then your chance of having a uh, an IQ less than 70, which means having an intellectual disability, um, means if, if you've never had a seizure, about 10% of those with TSC will have 
an intellectual disability. But if you've had seizures, then your risk of having an intellectual disability is about two thirds. So if you've got bad seizures and you've got TSC, the majority of people with that will also also have intellectual disability, which is a, a, um, uh, an additional burden to the epilepsy. So we know that that sort of slide, it's, you know, you guys are all living this, so it's sort of a, a glib slide, but it's it's a, it's fairly um, a bit of a depressing slide, really. <laughs> um, so then, so this <clears throat> so this is the hopeful slide. Um, what can we do about it? Um, and uh, and this slide this so when when you still medications are still the frontline treatment for for people with epilepsy. And as I said. Majority of people will, will come under control with one or two medicines, but not so with TS with tuberous sclerosis. <clears throat> and so, what do we do uh, as as a doctor? What do we what do we think about? And um, and what do we discuss with our with our families with with children affected and adults affected with TSC? So we think about some of the you know if they've failed a couple of medicines, are there new are there new medicines? Are there medicines we haven't tried? And that's often if you fail two medicines. Um, are uh, um, if you fail two medicines, then um, it, you know it means you might try be trying something new or something like like vigabatrin or uh, one of those medicines. Um, wh when we fail two medicines, we do think about other alternatives, and particularly in the young epilepsy diets. And so, in the preschool age child, particularly. Um, this is a, a the ketogenic diet is something used um, relatively frequently in those with very severe epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis, and it seems that that people with with um, tuberous sclerosis seem to respond on better uh, on average better than other people with epilepsy when it comes to the diet. And we've treated a number of people uh, very successfully, and a number of families I've looked after would look back and say that the ketogenic diet was was the best treatment that they had out of all the out of all the treatments. We won't I won't go into too much more detail about that, but but it's of course even though it sounds a very um, a very nice idea to, to treat somebody with a diet, it's still an enormous amount of work, and I and I um, uh, uh, for particularly falling on usually the the mother um, who does all the cooking, um, and it, and it's a very extreme diet. It's 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 a very high fat diet and, and a, Fairly unpalatable, and so when we're looking at older children, uh, primary school age, um, and even high school, then a, a ketogenic diet, a, a full ketogenic diet, is, is really impossible, and we have to try things, alternatives that are sometimes not as successful. Moving on, though, the other the other uh, options we think about the vagal nerve stimulator is something that's offered in um, I think it's offered in offered in most capital cities in Australia. Um, it, certainly, we offer it in Sydney and um, I think Brisbane, um, definitely Melbourne and Perth as well. Um, I, I don't think I've ever um, used it in a child with tuberous sclerosis. It's generally a treatment, almost a really a last resort for those who've got such severe epilepsy that they're, you know, they're, they're seizing all the time and have failed everything else. It's not not really something we think of as a as a uh, very uh, really as a last resort. Epilepsy surgery. I'm not going to spend too much time um, talking about, but um, look. Uh, but just to say that, it, in general, people would say about 10% of the tuberous sclerosis uh, population with epilepsy um, would potentially qualify for epilepsy surgery and may benefit from that. Um, uh, there are certainly some. Uh, the easiest. The, the the people that are most helped by uh, epilepsy surgery are if we can find one particular tuber that is um, that is causing all the trouble. It's a lot more controversial, um, uh, and I suppose it's not fully resolved whether the concept of doing multiple tuberectomies is um, is a benefit to children. And and certainly, um, you know, that is being done in in some in Melbourne and and, uh, and a few centres around the world, but. Really, the jury is still out on whether that's a good option or not for for um, for people with with um, TSC. 
So that's just a broad topic, and I'll now get to the to the um, to the really to the topic of interest. Um, and this, uh, you know, if we look back, you know, five years ago, even you know, five or six years ago, if I came on to, um, you know, if I saw you in clinic or you know came and gave a talk and said, look, I want to give your four-year-old or, or two-year-old um, a component of marijuana, I'd, I'd be locked up in jail. And um, and so five or six years ago, there'd be no... People would think this is a crazy idea. And it really is an amazing sign of the times. And I think it's really, you know, the, the internet and, you know, how, how information now travels around the world so quickly that... This has been a we've we've become the opposite. We're now we've now demanding marijuana. Um, we're 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 um, uh, you know saying why can't everyone have it? Uh, essentially, to treat our children with epilepsy, and that that's a, a, a really a um, a mind blowing change in in um, in uh, in in the public's uh, um, perception of 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 marijuana from a from a dangerous drug and a you know addictive drug to to something that we're going to give to our children with epilepsy, and and I think that's part of that mind change is why you know many doctors who are traditionally of course very conservative um, and and really one of our mottos is to do no harm. You know it's, it's one reason why we why people have been very why the medical profession has been very slow to embrace some of the trends. Um, and so, so the other thing to say about this is that it's also it's also big business as well. So it's not just about um, you know somebody who is uh, who may be dying from cancer or and and is just um, is just accessing some marijuana from a from a nephew to help them in their uh, through their last days. This is a very very big business and. And, and you do need to be conscious of that because um, that that marketing and the you know it's it's not just a homegrown sort of product. It is, this is a multi-billion-dollar business, and people are they're talking about this being you know um, you know people buying large blocks of Amazon rainforest and you know chopping down the forest and putting up marijuana because there is so much money to be made. And when there is a lot of money to be made. Then you've got to be cautious about many of the things you hear and the things you read because that's what advertising is about. You know, they want to, that people want to push, uh, they want to make money, and so that's you've got to got to be careful about some of the things that we that we read about on um, and see on the internet. Um, so just moving on, but this sort of thing you read on the internet is very. Uh, it's very hard to argue with. Um, so this is um, this. Uh, if we had a, um, if it was an audience, I'd give a prize to who could guess who this young lady is. But this is Charlotte Figgy, uh, who is a, a girl with uh, a condition called Dravet syndrome, a very severe epilepsy. Um, and she really, her parents lived in Colorado, and um, because um, Colorado had very liberal laws on medical cannabis, on cannabis, they they approached their local grower who said to try try some cannabis. And so this is uh, sort of photos of her um, with terrible epilepsy on the left and um, and then after being on the cannabis oil, um, uh, so a considerable improvement. And um, and whenever you, Charlotte Figgy will, um, if you, ever you Google medicinal cannabis, Charlotte Figgy will be always mentioned somewhere in, in, um, in some of those pictures. Now, the question is partly... Um, you know this this improvement is you know uh, certainly it, it seems likely that the, whatever she was given improved things for her. But does that apply to everybody? And um, and when you look at some of the internet stories, in fact, it's often the same stories going around. Um, so you do read the miracle stories, but when you look into them a little bit more, um, sometimes they're the, they're they're Almost, this is the same story recycled, and and um, so again, just to be a bit cautious. But but as a parent, I can you know I you know if I if I saw you know if I see my child seizing, and and then I and then I see um, 
a, a miracle, um, then you're going to, it's very hard to argue with that. It's very hard to not, um, not want to try something to help your child who, who is um, seeing a child suffer with so many seizures. So it's, it's a very difficult, very difficult balance. And, and, um, and it's that balance between the potential risks of the unknown versus the hope um, and, and also desperation. Um, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, and it's it's interesting. So this sort of this is a couple of years old now, but it's it, you know we, we've been talking about um, medical cannabis for you know I don't know probably twenty or thirty years when it comes to the terminally ill, and um, and so that there's certainly the majority of Australians do support the use of medical marijuana, um, and that that's well known. Although the use in other um, other problem in other conditions apart from terminal illness is um, is much more recent. And the other sort of um, driver to this is that a lot of Australians um, have personally used cannabis um, in the last twelve months, and so that's also a um, uh, a, a um, sort of a re somewhat reassuring factor, I suppose, saying, well, you know, you hear things like. Um, uh, that um, you know that marijuana never killed anybody, and um, uh, you know it's a very, it's a very safe and natural substance. So it, it's um, it, it's that that's a you know that's a lot of people's personal experience, but but also we've also got the experience of uh, of young people who uh, have much higher rates of uh, of problems of mental illness and schizophrenia, and Certainly, um, most people can talk about people from their, you know, from the years at school who were heavy cannabis users and really um, ended up nowhere. Um, and so, there's no, there's no doubt that cannabis, uh, like all medications, uh, all you know, that there is, there is potentially a place for it in society, but it's got to be, you know, except, you know, using it incorrectly can lead to trouble and also. Certain people can be very sensitive to the effects of cannabis, uh, and be you know if they're if they're predisposed to um, to say schizophrenia genetically, then this sort of thing can tip them over. Um, so, so we've got to be a bit cautious about about the use of cannabis, and particularly uh, in children, um, because really there is all of the information that we we know about the harms of medical cannabis. Are really based on um, on older people, so essentially adolescents and young adults. Um, the, the, you know, there's, there's a large amount of data on on those risks, um, and but we don't know the effects on the developing brain. And again, the argument: this is a natural substance. Well, that, that just isn't an that is just not an argument because heroin is a natural substance, alcohol is a natural substance. You know, the fact that it's natural is not um, is not uh, a you know, sugar. Sugar is a natural substance. It, it, it's just it's just how you use it. If you, if you have you know something is clearly dangerous. You know, a small amount of heroin is pretty dangerous, but also a small amount of heroin-like substance is, is safe to use if you've got severe pain. But um, but it, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. It's, and also, it is a drug. There's there's just yeah, it's not a herb; it's a drug because it has an effect on people. There's, 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 no one can argue with that. But if you hear those arguments, it's then you've got to be a bit. Qu you've got to question really who's making those arguments. Um, and, and it's not. I am being a, sounding a bit like an old um, conservative fuddy-duddy at the moment. But uh, but but it's partly because I think the balance has swung too much towards saying let's just go for it. Let's just. Whoever, whoever, um, uh, whoever um, needs this should have it because we're we're not there yet. We're, we've got to work towards making sure this is safe. So the, again, these are some of the images. Um, I'm not not sure who the little girl is on the bottom of the page there, but she's a I think her mother. She's got a severe epilepsy, and a, um, I think her mother was giving her some um, artisanal oil um, from Victoria. Um, Andrew Catalaris is the happy, smiling um, man uh, who you might have seen on the Sunday night program, and um, and he was 
he was uh, he was a, a deregistered doctor actually, but um, certainly one of the champions of, of um, medicinal cannabis. And um, I, I do look at these pictures and and see um, I, I it does make me shudder a little bit um, thinking. Um, you know, would I give my child something like this? I, you know, I don't know what I'm, you know, you really don't know, you really are trusting very much people who, um, who are, you know, are sometimes a bit on the extreme end. And, and that, that's a, a very difficult challenge um, when you're desperate to get the compound. Um, just changing the slide. And, and this, uh, this um, man here, Tony, I, I'm not sure of his last name, but he's, he is, uh, he's been in the business of supplying um, medicinal cannabis to you know, large numbers of the Australian population, probably the biggest supplier in Australia um, up, up until recently anyway. And, um, and, and really, I, you know, I'm not being critical of him, um, but it's, it, it does come down to a question of trust. Um, you know, do, would, do you trust this man that he would be making something safe for your child to consume? And my, the, the answer for me would be very clearly no. Um, uh, and when uh, sample, and this ha has happened in the US as well as um, in Australia, when when samples of sort of homegrown marijuana are tested in the lab, they can contain all sorts of stuff. And, and it's no surprise because they're just grown out in the backyard. They can have, um, or you know, or in a you know in a, in a greenhouse and. Um, and they can contain all sorts of things, you know, what depends what's in the soil, um, back, you know, bacteria, pesticides. And when they, when they treat it, they really, they, they don't, you know, they don't really know, they've got theories and, and they sound confident, but they, they don't know what's in the bottle. And, and there are many parents that I see and I ask them, what are you, you know, what is in that bottle? And they, they don't know. And I, and I find, I do find that, um, uh, you know, I think it's a mark of, dis I find it disturbing, I find it a mark it's a, sort of a mark of how desperate the families are, um, sometimes misguided as well, I think, um, but anyway. So particularly, I think, particularly in Australia, the local supply, you've got to be extremely cautious about. Um, that, that's probably the main message of this slide. Um, you know, if it's left out in the rain, you know, moulds develop very quickly. It, the, 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 the stuff that's produced in a in a by a pharm pharmaceutical industry is incredibly tightly controlled, and um, and there's a reason for it. That that it means that every bottle has got exactly the same component in it, and this stuff varies from varies from bottle to bottle, and um, and can contain all sorts of nasty things. Okay, the next slide. Um, and so this look, this is a slide from one of the main manufacturers, uh, which is GW Pharma, and, and uh, they're the ones who you may have heard um, they just published um, their first uh, their first uh, randomised trial of cannabis in that Dravet syndrome showing some benefit. And um, again, you know, people might criticise criticize the industrialise, you know, the industrial, um, you know, they want natural substances, and but natural, uh, trying to produce massive amounts of control very natural substances is nearly impossible, but these products are from plants. They're they're, they're not manufactured; they're they're extracted from plants and and very high quality. And and that's really what we're what we're hoping for is that we can. Um, uh, uh, but the problem is that it costs money. Uh, to 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 make medicines costs loads and loads of money, and and it takes uh, and there are many many safety checks, and that's why it's take going so slow and. Um, uh, well, one of the reasons it's going so slow. So, when we think about um, you know what the components of a cannabis plant, um, you'll hear about that, that there's two. There are many components. Um, the two main ones you hear about are the THC, which is the main component of street cannabis, and that's the stuff that makes you uh, gives you makes you high. Um, it also makes you a bit paranoid as well if it's in too high concentrations, um, and that's that's can be in about eight to ten percent of the of the plant when you smoke it. Um, and the other the other fairly large component is cannabidiol, 
And often people talk about that ratio between you know, the different strains of cannabis is the cannabidiol for recreational smokers often has a more calming effect. And um, if there's too much, if the imbalance is wrong, then it can be very, makes, makes you very anxious and very um, uh, sort of agitated um, if the balance between the CBD and the THC is, is not right. Now, when, um, so what we're, what we're interested in, so, and all the studies that have looked at the, some of the dangers of cannabis are really based on, uh, on the THC component, um, not the CBD. And so in the lab, when uh, some of these companies in the 80s started, in the 80s and 90s started looking at um, how these uh, compounds work, they found that both CBD and THC worked in animal models of, ep of epilepsy. So animals who had epilepsy um, would um, were given these compounds and, and proved to be effective. And that process um, from starting with, um, you know, in the lab with animals and then going to, um, to humans is sort of the process we're in right now. But the component that um, because of the worries about the THC, um, the, uh, the, the, most of the research has been on CBD or, or other similar compounds. And so this is, this is uh, the compound that's probably most advanced. Um, and so this, this drug is the one that was published in the trial this week. Um, and it's the, it's the drug that we do have available um, in New South Wales at the moment. So the, the 40 children who've got um, uh, extremely severe epilepsy who are getting, are getting this at the moment. Um, and this Epidiolex is the compound that is about to be trialled uh, well, has begun trials um, in the US and about to start um, actually this week in Australia um, to see if Epidiolex uh, helps um, people with uh, the epilepsy and people with tuberous sclerosis. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So how how it comes, it is a, it's a botanical extract of a plant um, and it's more than 98% uh, cannabidiol and it's got very small amount of the THC so not enough that it would do anything to you. The other parts that they put in it, um, there's a smaller amount of ethanol, which is alcohol, and that's to, that's really there as a preservative. Um, although I think the the plans are that, that the alcohol will be taken out eventually. It's, it's it is it doesn't not enough to make you drunk or anything, nor your child drunk. It's a very small amount. Um, it does contain um, a, a sweetener, uh, sesame oil, and that just helps stabilize the the, um, the the cannabidiol and also strawberry flavoring flavoring so it's sort of a I can't call, I have never I haven't tasted it myself but I can't imagine that that mix of strawberry sesame and um, and grass but uh, I've got an older a 16 year old girl who um, who doesn't who drinks it but thinks it just you know it doesn't it tastes like the strawberry flavoring I think it hasn't got much of a, much of a flavor but she doesn't like it very much uh, but most of the children do take it and it's it's an oil um, and it can be put down a um, it can be put you know the child's got a, an in, you know, a feeding tube um, it can be put down that feeding tube as well um, so it's not rubbed under the skin or anything it's just taken orally and you you don't want to you wouldn't want to um, heat it either because it would um, it's got alcohol so it would actually if you put a match to it it would, um, it would burst into flame so no, no doing that um, all right, so uh, what do we know about this drug? And this, so until um, this, this publication this week, um, this, 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 this is a trial, there's been a few trials done in a couple of hundred children. And what it generally showed was um, that it's not a, it's not a miracle, um, but these, these are children who failed multiple medicines. And so after sort of three months of being on this, on cannabidiol, about, one in one in twenty became seizure free, um, which is not doesn't sound very good, um, but that's important to know because if you go on the internet, you, you think that one hundred percent of people got became seizure free. But even Charlotte Figgy is not seizure free; she still has seizures. It's just they're much reduced. Um, and what they found is about uh, about. 40% of children had, uh, sorry, 40% of the of the patients had a had a reduction in their seizures of about 50%. So that means that uh, um, that 
more than half of the people who get um, the epidiolex don't get a very big improvement. Um, but this is a group that have failed multiple medicines before. So it is, it's encouraging um, data. And this is the first um, cannabis medicine used. So there, there may be, like all medicines, it will undergo development and, and maybe other components of the cannabis plant may yield better results. But it's, it's important to show that it's not, it's not a miracle drug. It, it is very helpful for a group of people with bad epilepsy. But in fact, for the most people with bad epilepsy, it doesn't make a very big difference at all. And, um, and that's, that's a very important message. Um, okay. And the randomized control trial found a very, had a very similar finding uh, to that. It's going to be very interesting to see in the in the tuberous sclerosis population if it if it if it is uh, effective, um, and so that's sort of showing. Um, it's just sort of saying the same thing. I'll, I'll move on because I'm aware of the time. Now the other important thing, and and partly why I'm showing you this information is because you you this is why we need to do trials because if we don't test this drug properly, and if everyone just goes for it, then we really won't learn. And it, and it, and really, even every, everything that we have that's sort of good in life, you know, technology, it comes from trial, trial and error. You know, we, we, things are developed, you know, medicines and, you know, um, uh, really everything in medicine comes through um, doing trials and scientific advances. And if we just say, go for it um, and don't, don't do the trials, then we just we won't learn. We'll just we'll just hear, well, okay, it worked for Joe, but it didn't work for Sue, and oh, you know, and um, and, and someone else vomited with it. You know, we, we just won't learn. And so the, the only way we do learn and, and and progress things is to is to say is to test it. And so we might find in tuberous sclerosis that it is a particularly good drug, but we might find that. Um, in another uh, in another type of epilepsy that's completely useless, and and so it means that that sort of information we've got to, you know otherwise we you know, we may as well go home you know it's, it's just we, we can the way we improve our knowledge and help people is by is through trials um, that, and that's a fairly hard message because they take time and people want it now but they don't want the trials so so these are the common side effects and look when you've got a trial. You have to write down everything. Um, uh, you have to write down everything that um, uh, if you, you know. If your child gets a cold uh, on a trial, that's got to be written down, even though it's got nothing at all to do with the drug. And so, it's very basically there are lots you know, in general life. There are lots of side effects. And so, um, in this over this twelve week period, sort of four out of the five children getting the epidiolex reported negative effects. And the most common was somnolence. And I see a few people, Claire's just answered that one. But somnolence just means um, means being sleepy. And, and we've seen that. Um, but it, uh, it, it means being uh, very sleepy. And we've got to, in some people, what that means is uh, how we've dealt with that in, in our in our experiences. Sometimes you drop other medicines or that you just reduce the dose of the epidiolex. But that's a fairly common effect. It could be a good thing if your child's not going to sleep at night time. It, can, it could be a very good side effect, but not so good if they're um, if you're trying to get them off to school in the morning. Um, but generally, that's that is manageable for most people. Um, interestingly, the decreased appetite you wouldn't. It's not sort of the first thing you think about when you think about marijuana. Um, you think about increased appetite, but this particular component of the plant um, sometimes uh, does upset the tummy a bit. And these very high rates of uh, it reported in these trials of, of diarrhea and reduced appetite, we, we haven't actually seen in, in our experience in New South Wales in the 40 or, 40 or so kids, we've, we've not seen um, anyone with diarrhea. So I, I don't know if it's to do with the Australian diet or something, but we, we haven't seen that problem. It's been a few kids with decreased appetite, but not, that, hasn't, that hasn't been such a big thing. Um, the final one there is convulsion, and so this is always tricky because um, you know uh, 
but certainly in a in a small group of people who have this drug, the doctors and the families are convinced that the epilepsy's got worse, and so that it really is just a few percent of people whose epilepsy has seemed to got worse on on this medicine. But uh, I, you know, I, I haven't seen that yet, and it's very difficult because we're dealing with people with bad epilepsy, and they can have a bad seizure one day, and it, that can just be because that was going to happen, and nothing to do with the drug. Um, so. Uh, and so about one in, uh, maybe one in 15 people came off because they didn't like the medicine. Um, and I've certainly seen, seen that problem as well, where people have just felt it made the kitties too dopey. Um, uh, not, not dopey in a, in a, um, what, what you would expect with someone who is dopey, um, uh, on marijuana, but, um, but just more sleepy is probably the more correct word. They're, they're just, uh, too sleepy on it. Um, and another problem uh, that, we've, that we've seen as well is abnormalities with um, your liver function. And so any, any sort of um, plant-based material, any, plant, any drugs that come from plants, a very common side effect is liver abnormalities. And so um, definitely we recommend frequent blood tests if anyone's using this um, because it can, and particularly if you're on other medicines as well, like, like, um, like epilim, um, uh, where you can, some, where there's been a few cases of, of, of sort of, um, uh, I've had to stop a couple of people where their liver fun, you know, they've got hep, a drug induced hepatitis. Um, and look at someone, uh, Effie there has just asked me, is that, um, are those percentages higher than, you know, than those of other drugs? And, and look, probably the sleepiness, um, yeah, compared to say other epilepsy drugs, the, the sleepiness is probably is more common than, um, in other drugs. But, but it is, you know, sleepiness is, um, and, and probably the liver, we still don't know yet um, about the liver abnormalities. It seems to be fairly, um, certainly something we've got to watch. No, no one has been, uh, no one's had liver failure or a really severe liver injury. Um, but it's probably, that's probably is, we're seeing that more frequently at the moment than we would see in normal medicines. Um, but some of the... Uh, in a way, it, it's, it's certainly not worse than the other drugs. Um, uh, and a few families have said to me they feel it's the best, you know, even though the, some of the, the epilepsy effect hasn't been that great um, for some of them, they still feel the children are, are a bit better on it compared to some of the epilepsy drugs. Um, yeah, so, look, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think one of the main, the main messages is and I've probably have been harping on it a bit too much, but um, that I, I, to me, it's a very important message that this is a drug. You know, it, it might be a wonderful drug. We're not don't know yet, but it is a drug. It's not. It's nothing. It's not magic, and it's not. It's not a herb. It's, it's a drug, and um, and uh, and it behaves like a drug. It inter it interacts with other medicines. It produces side effects like drugs. If some, if, if a, a substance is strong enough to to stop seizures, it's got it can't all be good. There's just nothing in there's just nothing in the world that's perfect. So um, so there's always there's always you know even some of the best things have always got a downside to them. So uh, part of the problem at the moment is people are feeling like this is the most wonderful thing when. When really it's um it's got we're just learning we're still just learning about it and um and there's definitely going to be downsides there there's just that's that's what life you know you all know that that life's like that but um but at the moment it seems the, the the bottom line from its safety point of view is if it's managed properly it seems to be relatively safe but again you know if I prescribed um if I prescribed Tegretol I can I can say to you that this drug has been around for 50 or 60 years and we know pretty much everything, you know, we do know everything about it. And we know that millions and millions of people have taken Tegretol. So we know everything about it. Um, and we know that people have been on it for 30 and 40 years and their head hasn't fallen off. You know, we know, we know that, it's, um, that it's safe in the long term. But we don't know that about marijuana. So we're giving a, a high dose of a plant 
based drug to a two-year-old and we don't know what that means at all for you know in 10 years time or five years time we've got no idea um, and and that's why we've got to be cautious um, uh, people say it's been around you know marijuana has been around for thousands of years yeah sure it has but no one's been giving it to their children for thousands of years so it's only been given to adults so it's um so it's a it, it, we can't go into this blindly um not not to say we shouldn't do it because i think you know when you've got no options this is this is why you have to we have to do the trials yeah someone just asked why tests on children rather than adults and i, I think um uh, I think that's a very good question, and part of that is consumer pressure. So, um, the, the, in fact, what what does happen is uh, for, for almost um, for almost all drugs, um, the uh, um, for almost all medicines, they're tested on um, they're tested on uh, adults first of all, and then children. So this this is unusual that it's come to the children first, and it's mainly because of um, Mainly because of uh, the consumer pressure, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Look, I'm going to um, I'm going to try and um, before we I'm going to we, we, all we've talked about is marijuana, which is probably okay, I suppose. Um, but just to quickly say, um, so that the in tuberous sclerosis, there was one uh, study published from Boston again with 18 um, 18 people uh, with TS, and and Elizabeth Hill when she came out to Australia. Um, to the annual meeting a year and a half ago, did speak about this, and she, and Elizabeth said very much that she felt this had a, the cannabidiol had a she felt would become a frontline drug for tuberous sclerosis from her early experience. So so I am very excited about um, about the trial coming up. The trial is certainly not for everyone. It's a, a very big burden for those to be involved. Many visits, blood tests, um, and their epilepsy has. Um, the epilepsy has to be um, severe enough. Um, you, know, you need to be having uh, very frequent, fairly frequent cannabis seizures to go in the trial. Um, it's also very resource intensive, so we're probably only going to be able to enrol about ten at Ramwick. Um, and there are several adult sites. There's three in Melbourne um, and one in Brisbane who are also involved. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll just. Um, See, I might just bring it to a close here. Um, now, let's see, which bug on those questions again? So, look, I might, I, just to interest of time, I think I might just open that to questions um, uh, now. Um, yeah. Um, John, so, it's Graham here. Yeah. Um, okay. If we've got time, I don't know how long it's going to take to um, just race through maybe some of the mTOR inhibitor content really quickly, and maybe then we can um, yeah. go into sure, sure. the more complex questions, I guess, around medicinal cannabis in TSC, and yeah. um, then yeah. I think there's okay. a few questions emerging about sort of, you know, head-to-head, -head, how do people make decisions, so it'd probably be good to get through the mTOR inhibitor stuff, and then we can yeah. talk about that. Uh, sure, sure. Okay, I'll do. Look, I'm sorry for blabbing on. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, really, it does take a long time to talk about, it, doesn't it? Um, so, look, the um, so I'll quickly go to the mTOR inhibitors. And so, in Australia, we're we're lucky to have access to both um, to Everolimus and Sirolimus. Um, and the Everolimus is approved by the um, TGA and also approved by the um, PBAC, which means it's funded. For the treatment of of tumours in tuberous sclerosis, so primarily um, the seizures in the brain, uh, kidney angiomyelopomas, um, uh, not not necessarily approved for the skin. Um, and a big question, a big question is, does it help? Um, uh, does it also help epilepsy and thinking in in, um, in tuberous sclerosis? Sorry. Um, and so look, I'll, I'll, everyone's seen that horrible slide, um, but it, the Everlimus. Uh, you know the the, path, the main pathway in tuberous sclerosis where the problem with the genes are the everlimus works on um, on dampening down that overactive mTOR pathway um, and so I was part part of a trial and um, and certainly even some of the members of the audience were part of this trial um, there were there were in fact ten ten uh, people with tuberous sclerosis 
that enrolled uh, in the from the, in Sydney. Uh, I think there were maybe two or three in Melbourne uh, who enrolled in the Exist three trial, and this reported uh, about six months ago. And it, looking at Everlim is to treat epilepsy in different dose levels. Um, and what it showed was that um, the results are not so different, I suppose, to the cannabis trials. So in the in the yellow bars is the high dose Everlimus, and if you took all of the patients, about 300 of them, then on average there was a 40% reduction in their seizures from baseline over a three month period. And so some had, you know, like a 90 to 100% reduction. Some might have only had, um, you know, a 10% reduction. But on average, um, they had about a 40% reduction in seizures with the higher dose, a bit less with the lower dose group. And so this meant overall about 40% of the group had more than half their seizures reduced at three months. And, and certainly the experience of the families that were involved with in, in Sydney, they did that, that's, that's the case not for all, but for, um, for the majority of them. Now, this list of side effects is a lot worse than the, uh, the cannabis side effects, um, but generally they are manageable. The, the, the mTOR inhibitors are, they also um, decrease your immune system a bit, and some of the biggest problems are mouth ulcers um, and also just minor viral infections. And we see a lot of it in the first six months of treatment, but that really begins to decrease after that. And it's not so different to your normal coughs and colds after that time. But it is a strong drug and we have to be, really it should be prescribed by someone who understands, who's got some experience with it. And there's not too many doctors who do. Probably kidney doctors in Australia, apart from TS doctors, have some idea. And so it can produce a few other little problems, liver function problems, very long list there, um, uh, can affect, make the cholesterol go a bit higher as well. But these drugs, when they're given to, um, given to animals, they, they can live, you know, they're sort of called the uh, immortality drug because um, you can, it's one of those medicines that sort of, in theory, can prolong life as well. So, um, so it is being used in a, in a number of different um, anti-aging trials at the moment as well. So broadly, um, I suppose just to summarise, um, we're, we're in a fortunate position that we we are uh, that we do have more options for tuberous sclerosis. Um, but going back to my very first slide, this you know this condition has has a huge burden and. Um, uh, and epilepsy is an enormous part of the burden uh, on children and, their, and adults and their families with TSC. And this, these new treatments mean that some people may benefit, um, uh, but um, not all will. And so, and, it, and it's through being involved in trials and making advances that we, you know, that hopefully we can lead to improvements. And, and the simple, you know, Certainly, the Everlimus trials have certainly already made big differences in Australia, where um, you know there, there's so much less surgery done for tuberous sclerosis, um, for tumours, um, for kidney problems. Much improved on these new drugs, and um, although the and for some of the people with epilepsy, it certainly has made some significant improvements, but not hasn't cured, doesn't cure the problem, but um, but improves the quality of life for many. So I might. Um, I'll just leave it, leave it there and open up for questions. Um, so, John, um, I think I'll I, try and uh, maybe manage the questions a little so that we can um, try and answer a few that have come through that are similar. Yeah. Um, sure. I think that probably the, the biggest question to ask then is to, um, for the parents that are weighing up a child living with seizures and, and certainly, you know, parents um, of, of adults with tuberous sclerosis find themselves in this situation as well, living with seizures and all of the um, impacts that has on their lives and potential you know, risks of intellectual impairment, etc., that have gone through, and, and although I, I know that neurologists say that the patient failed the drugs, but we like to say that the drugs failed the patient, um, have been in that situation. You mentioned surgery and that multiple tuberectomies, questionable benefit versus risks, these new options obviously don't have a very clear profile and we don't have a lot of tools to predict which will be effective. 
what are the sort of things that you think about when a, when a parent and, or a patient comes to you and says, what should be the next option that they try? How do you weigh up all of these imperfect options that we now have on the table? Yeah, look, I think it. I think it's very much um, comes down to a a good discussion about different options, and uh, and I suppose uh, trying to help families to trying to help educate them as well, and and also for them to educate me about about what's worked in the past. Um, so there, there really is a black and white answer for anything, um, and. And that can be difficult when you're faced with a number of options. The, the easiest options are always to try a new medicine. Um, and so in the early stages of epilepsy, um, the simplest thing is to try medicine. And, and for many people, that does the trick. It, 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 um, it, it help, you know, helps significantly. Um, but if those medicines are failing, that's when we, when we have to think of those, those broad array of options, including surgery, including the diet, or these new treatments. In general, the really new treatments, we don't, try, we don't offer them first of all. Um, and so they are down to things like cannabis and like um, the mTOR inhibitors for epilepsy. We, we do have them often as our, our fifth or sixth choice, partly because <clears throat> um, the, uh, the risks are higher in that. You know, it's like surgery. You know, it's not surgery is not a simple thing. It's something you, you want to make sure that you've tried many other things before you go to surgery. Um, so it's it's a sort of a balance between you know going for the things that we know are safe and are proven before and working our way down the list. It, it very much is a decision though in partnership, and I think I think seeing you know. Again, you know, 30 years ago, it used to be the doctor, the very paternalistic approach, where the, you'd go and see the doctor and the doctor would say, okay, you're going to do this, and, and most people would just go and do whatever they were told. But that, those days are long past, and, and really, which makes it harder for me now, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but, the, but, but now it really is a discussion and, and saying what and it, very much an individual plan based on what the family's experience has been and and what their preferences are. I don't know if that's a very broad answer, I suppose, Claire, but yeah. I think, I think that's the, uh, the the answer to that question, though, isn't it? It becomes a, a, a conversation that people have to have, both within their family and then with the help of their doctor, about how to make these difficult yeah. decisions. Um, something I always find interesting in the, in the tuber sclerosis specific research that I get exposed to is that exciting work that they're looking at now of trying to divide up people with TSC into these groups and identify how do we tell which treatment might work better for, for which particular person, whether that's through understanding a gene mutation yeah. or looking for another chemical or whatever it is that, that helps us kind of create subcategories in TSC. And I think that's probably going to be a really big um, step forward for us because we've got these options now and, and it's about how do we take some of the guesswork out and not necessarily lose that precious time of, you know, weaning onto and off repeated medicines and, and you know, doing these approaches. So that's a, it's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of specific yeah. questions that might be interesting to ask. So um, yeah. Erin's asked uh, about dosing around Everolimus. Um, so, you know, how do you dose? And, you know, the study looked at both high and low dose in that, in that randomised trial. Yeah. Um, and then, you know. That's right. Changing doses as, yeah. as so, come up, etc. Yeah. So for, for the Everolimus, um, there's no no doubt that um, the low dose low dose uh, Everolimus um, helps shrink tumours. So if you've got a kidney tumour or a, or a SEGA, you often don't need a very high dose. You, you can get by with the low dose range. But with epilepsy, um, it seems that you need the higher doses. And so in that trial, the side effects were no more in the higher dose. Um, they weren't any greater uh, or more serious. Um, and so what, I, what I've been doing with, so I tend to start at low dose. And if that's not working, then I push it up to the higher dose and see if it works. And generally, um, so most epilepsy drugs, you know, within a week or two whether they're working or not. But the Everolimus takes longer to work because it sort of 
I was sort of thinking about getting into the brain and working on the pathway and making some more significant change. And and so in in general, I'd be waiting sort of more like six to eight weeks before declaring something not working. So broadly, I start with a low dose for epilepsy, and if it's not working, then I go I give somebody a trial at a higher dose. Um, somebody did. I think somebody also asked about the young uh, the young group as well. So um, the youngest in the trials was down to two years, but I have treated a couple of children under two years of age. You just got to be just because young children are so prone to to viral infections, you've got to you know you've got to be a bit more cautious about it. But if 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 the, if the situation is bad enough, meaning their epilepsy is very, very bad, then I would try it in that age group if other things have failed. Um, a couple of questions about the adult trials as well. So unfortunately, there is no adult trial in New South Wales uh, uh, for the for the epi dialects, um, and that's a prop that is a problem. Um, there is a potential. Um, the trial is going to be running from sort of now, and at the moment, it's going to be recruiting up until. Um, we've been told uh, around the end of September. Uh, it may go longer if they don't. What they have to do is get about 150 people um, worldwide. And so, if um, if the if the trial is having trouble getting those numbers, then they'll extend it a bit longer. Um, similarly, with the adult trial, we 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 have a potential to include adults, but we, unfortunately, because we're a paediatric hospital. We're going to be doing the children first, and if there is any any time left, we we may be able to do some adults, but it's not not easy at the moment. It's unlikely, I suppose. Uh, just as a, a a plug, I suppose Tuberous Growth Australia has the contact details for the study coordinators at each of the sites, um, so we have permission to share those with you, but to contact us directly so that we can not we can avoid those. Um, researchers and, and certainly particularly the neurologists um, from being bombarded. So contact us via the um, info at TSA email address or via our 1300 number and we can put you in touch with those study site coordinators um, if that's an option for you. So um, yeah, feel free to do that. Um, and yeah, I, I, uh, hopefully we uh, get quite a few Australians on the trial before the US sort of takes up more than their own quota in that because it'll be really good as a way for access. But then I think Mark has asked a question then subsequent to the trial, you know, get out your crystal ball and um, time machine, John, you know, how long is it, assuming there's some uh, yeah. reasonable data for even a subgroup of patients that this is effective, as it has been shown in Dravet's, how long before this becomes yeah. something that might be more widely available beyond the trial? Yeah, so the trial will have to be, will have to report as positive first of all. So. Um, if, if it does show a benefit, um, the, the, that will, if, if it sort of closes in recruiting in October, that means it's another um, sort of four months after that until all the information is in, and then it's basically another six months before that is published. So um, because they, they spent, they have to um, do all the checks and, and all the analysis, um, and so that means uh, you know, approximately halfway through next year, the results, the preliminary early results might be out. And if that comes up as positive, it means that the drug could get registered um, by the, always drugs are registered by either the Americans or the European agencies first. And once they're registered there, it means we can then, we can then get it in Australia. So I would think the, um, the earliest, uh, there's two questions. One is it being registered, but also who's going to pay for it? And, and that's something that's missing off the news at the moment. So um, this, the, the, the government's sort of saying, yes, there is drug in the country, but in fact, families have to pay for it. And so an average, you know, a, an average child to get medical marijuana, um, if they want to get it, it would cost them something like two to $3,000 per month. Um, so that some and that no one has sort of been saying that they're saying the drugs here you can prescribe it and those things are true but there is no one who's the government's not paying for it basically so families would have to pay um, and that's a huge imposition as well so that's a real barrier at the moment to um, to prescribing so what what we're hoping is the trials are like any other drug the trials are positive 
and then it goes through the same system of getting um, registered by the Australian government and then goes on to the PBS and we can write a prescription. I would say that is probably, you know, two years away until we can reach that sort of thing where you can just get a, go to any chemist and get some. Two years isn't too bad. It's really quite quick, but it's, it's a very long time when you've got epilepsy. Mm. Um, and I know that you know, when these are sort of positioned as the first medicine to meet that knee, I know that there's a lot of um, motivation from the medicine manufacturer to try and bring it to market as soon as possible. But even with that and with what the regulators call fast tracks, it still takes a really long time. Um, so, you know, we're still looking at another 12 months potentially until we have reimbursement for mTOR inhibitors for epilepsy, fingers crossed. And thank you to everyone that yeah. got involved in the work we've been doing around that. And, you know, and this is where we've had the trial results for nearly a year. So, um, you know, these things do take a lot of time, but those things take time because we need these hoops so that we make sure that the drug's effective and that we spend our limited health dollars as, you know, sensibly and, and rationally as possible. Um, there's a couple of other quick questions about the epidiolex yeah. trial around dates and yeah. um, placebo. If you quickly answer yeah. those and then we might try and yeah, wrap up so everyone can get on yeah. with their evening. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Claire. So the date, in fact, we just we got word today that we're going to be able to enrol our first patient on Friday. So um, that'll be exciting. And um, our ability to, we're probably going to enrol about one patient every two weeks from then on. Um, so that means, um, yeah, hopefully we'll be, um, yeah, so there's some people I know who are waiting out there to get started and um, and we've had some terrible delays getting it started, not not from any fault of our own, but just the terrible logistics. But but that's going to start this Friday, um, and it is a placebo trial. So uh, you've got um, essentially um, two chances. There's a a high dose and a, a low dose and a placebo. So you've got a one in three chance of getting placebo. Your child getting placebo, um, but um, after three months, um, everybody can get the medical cannabis. So even those on placebo can then cross over into get getting the medical cannabis. And unfortunately it's a it's a terrible thing if you're on placebo, but um, but it's the only it's really the only way we can truly learn um, what is the effect of and safety of this drug. Right, thanks Claire. Great. Thank you very much John. And look you know a huge thank you for giving up your time and setting aside for us two separate evenings for us to make this work. I mean I might be speaking before I've read the feedback, but I think tonight's gone really well. I know that you and I were both nervous about making sure that the uh, technology would work and that um, the content would get across, but you know, I found that incredibly informative. Um, so I hope everyone else has as well. And thank you to everyone that's that's come in this evening. There's a feedback survey on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, that will remain open for another five or so minutes after we wrap up tonight. So start filling it out if you can, but don't panic too much. And we'll say goodnight and you'll still have a few minutes to go. Um, uh, I just wanted to do a quick plug. So again, our TSC information service is here by email or phone. If there's questions raised from tonight and you want to know where to go to or just get some clarification, um, you'll usually get put through to either myself on my work days or Debbie Crosby, who will be known to some of you. And sometimes you'll get voicemail, but we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, and obviously email is another option which allows you to you know, work on these things in the evenings and, um, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So whether that's information about the medicinal cannabis or the epidiolex trials um, or more information about mTOR inhibitors or any aspect of what we know is a really difficult um, maze of, of figuring out epilepsy treatments when the, the first line options haven't worked. So please do get in touch. And the second plug is um, we're going to attempt another webinar um, and choosing quite a different topic but one that is always um, really well received at our face-to-face -face educational events. Um, so Dr. Shirag Patel from Queensland yeah. Clinical Genetics, who's part of one of our very, very valued adult multidisciplinary teams in Australia um, and was very well received at our uh, 2015 Sydney conference, will uh, be online to talk about the genetics of tuberous sclerosis. So a really good chance to maybe spread the word about these webinars to your extended family who might want to understand the genetics mm -hmm. of TSC 
uh, but may not feel like they can necessarily sit down with you and, and ask those questions or you may struggle to answer them. So a really good chance to spread this information to a wider network, um, not as complex as epilepsy treatment. Um, I, we hope. I mean, I think Shirag did a fantastic job in 2015. Um, so look, usually we wrap up and say thank you so much to John and present him with a glass of wine. Um, so I'm hoping that um, you can go and help yourself and I'll, uh, I'll pay you back next time I see you. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I know you're incredibly busy, um, but this has been incredibly valuable and I'll share some of the comments uh, with John that come through. So feel free to, um, to say thank you in your comments as well tonight. Any other comments, John? Are we good to say goodnight? No, no. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Hope it was good. <laughs> it was fantastic. Thanks, John. Good night, everyone. Yeah.